An Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine Chapter 5, Part 6 Sixth Note Con Conservative Action Upon Its Past As developments which are preceded by definite indications have a fair presumption in their favor, so those which do but contradict and reverse the course of doctrine which has been developed before them, and out of which they spring, are certainly corrupt. For a corruption is a development in that very stage in which it ceases to illustrate, and begins to disturb, the acquisitions gained in its previous history. It is the rule of creation, or rather of the phenomena which it presents, that life passes on to its termination by a gradual imperceptible course of change. There is ever a maximum in earthly excellence, and the operation of the same causes which made things great makes them small again. Weakness is but the resulting product of power. Events move in cycles. All things come round. The sun ariseth and goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. Flowers first bloom, then fade. Fruit ripens and decays. The fermenting process, unless stopped at the due point, corrupts the liquor which it has created. The grace of spring, the richness of autumn, are but for a moment, and worldly moralists bid us carpe diem, for we shall have no second opportunity. Virtue seems to lie in a mean between vice and vice, and as it grew out of imperfection, so to grow into enormity. There is a limit to human knowledge, and both sacred and profane writers witness that over-wisdom is folly. And in the political world, states rise and fall, the instruments of their aggrandizement becoming the weapons of their destruction, and hence the frequent ethical maxims such as ne quid nimis, nothing too much, medio tutissimus, in the middle of all things, vaulting ambition, which seem to imply that too much of what is good is evil. So great a paradox, of course, cannot be maintained as that truth literally leads to falsehood, or that there can be an excess of virtue. But the appearance of things and the popular language about them will at least serve us in obtaining an additional test for the discrimination of a bona fide development of an idea from its corruption. A true development, then, may be described as one which is conservative of the course of antecedent developments, being really those antecedents, and something besides them. It is an addition which illustrates, not obscures, corroborates, not corrects, the body of thought from which it proceeds. And this is its characteristic, as contrasted with a corruption. For instance, a gradual conversion from a false to a true religion plainly has much of the character of a continuous process, or a development in the mind itself even when the two religions, which are the limits of its course, are antagonists. Now, let it be observed that such a change consists in addition and increase chiefly, not in destruction. True religion is the summit and perfection of false religions. It combines in one whatever there is of good and true separately remaining in each. And in like manner, the Catholic creed is for the most part the combination of separate truths, which heretics have divided among themselves, and err in dividing. So that, in matter of fact, if a religious mind were educated in, and sincerely attached to, some form of heathenism or heresy, and then were brought under the light of truth, it would be drawn off from error into the truth, not by losing what it had, but by gaining what it had not, 
not by being unclothed, but by being clothed upon, that mortality may be swallowed up in life. That same principle of faith which attaches it at first to the wrong doctrine would attach it to the truth, and that portion of its original doctrine which was to be cast off as absolutely false would not be directly rejected, but indirectly, in the reception of the truth which is its opposite. True conversion is ever of a positive, not a negative, character. Such, too, is the theory of the Fathers as regards the doctrines fixed by councils, as is instanced in the language of St. Leo. To be seeking for what has been disclosed, to reconsider what has been finished, to tear up what has been laid down, what is this but to be unthankful for what has been gained? Vincentius of Larens, in like manner, speaks of the development of Christian doctrine as profectus fidei non permutatio, progress of the faith, not change. And so as regards the Jewish law, our Lord said that he came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Muhammad is accused of contradicting his earlier revelations by his later, which is a thing so well known to those of his sect that they all acknowledge it, and therefore, when the contradictions are such as they cannot solve them, then they will have one of the contradictory places to be revoked, and they reckon in the whole Al-Quran about a hundred and fifty verses which are thus revoked. Schelling, says Mr. Dewar, considers that the time has arrived when an esoteric, speculative Christianity ought to take the place of the exoteric empiricism which has hitherto prevailed. This German philosopher acknowledges that such a project is opposed to the evident design of the Church and of her earliest teachers. When Roman Catholics are accused of substituting another gospel for the primitive creed, they answer that they hold, and can show that they hold, the doctrines of the Incarnation and Atonement as firmly as any Protestant can state them. To this it is replied that they certainly do profess them, but that they obscure and virtually annul them by their additions that the cultus of St. Mary and the saints is no development of the truth, but a corruption and a religious mischief to those doctrines of which it is the corruption, because it draws away the mind and heart from Christ. But they answer that so far from this, it subserves, illustrates, protects the doctrine of our Lord's loving-kindness and mediation. Thus the parties in controversy join issue on the common ground, that a developed doctrine which reverses the course of development which has preceded it is no true development but a corruption. Also that what is corrupt acts as an element of unhealthiness towards what is sound. This subject, however, will come before us in its proper place by and by. Blackstone supplies us with an instance in another subject matter of a development which is justified by its utility, when he observes that, when society is once formed, government results, of course, as necessary to preserve and to keep that society in order. On the contrary, when the long Parliament proceeded to usurp the executive, they impaired the popular liberties which they seemed to be advancing. For the security of those liberties depends on the separation of the executive and legislative powers, or on the enactors being subjects, not executors, of the laws. And in the history of ancient Rome, from the time that the privileges gained by the tribunes in behalf of the people became an object of ambition to themselves, 
the development had changed into a corruption. And thus a sixth test of a true development is that it is of a tendency conservative of what has gone before it. End of part six of chapter five.